that. All right, now we're going to talk about tonight, uh, if I can get around to it here, a little bit of uh, something that'll maybe help you in a practical sense called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what you got and has nothing to do with water when you got saved. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 4, chapter Ephesians 4, chapter uh, verse number 4. There's one body and one spirit, even you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, and that baptism is not water. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all in you all. But unto every one of us is given the grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, whereupon he saith, He that ascended up on high led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it for? That he descended first in the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for a specific purpose and that is the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry to edify the body of Christ. The first thing I want to say about this is, is that if you got saved, the day you got saved, you were baptized into the Holy Spirit. Brother Sean Brown, you pray and ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Here we are, so thankful, Lord, for your many blessings. But we thank you, Lord, for the good picture, Lord, that we've seen already of the judgment of Christ. We pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, to keep that ever before our eyes. But we ask now for our preacher to bring word to us, Father, and let our hearts be open. Lord, let our ears be uh, blown out, Father, we can hear the word. More than it might settle down that heart and that good ground and produce some fruit, Father. Lord, as always, we love you and pray for your soon return. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, back to the book of Galatians as you're being seated there. Galatians chapter number 3. Now, the Apostle Paul tells you clearly in Galatians chapter number 1, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach to you any other gospel than that which I've preached, let him be accursed. And then he says it again. And what that means is, is that when it comes to the gospel that Paul's talking about, it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, was buried and raised again the third day according to Scripture. So that's your gospel for this day and time. When you do that, you get baptized into Christ. You don't get baptized in a pool of water. You get baptized by the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter number 3, pick it up in verse 24. Wherefore the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by what? Faith. But after the faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. You're no longer under the law. You're now set free. For ye are all children of God by faith in who? Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Want to get this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now what you want to recognize there is, is that once you got baptized, you're no longer male or female, you're no longer, uh, uh, as far as Jew or Gentile, you're no longer bond or free, you're all called Christians now, you're saved individuals. That's because you're all in one body. You're in uh, the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit that puts you in there. Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And pick it up in verse number 30. Ephesians 5 and verse number 30. For we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this call shall a man leave father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one fa uh, uh, flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular love his wife, even as himself. His wife, see that she reverence her husband. I'm not going to give you a marital thing there, but what he says there is, the great mystery is, is that you've been put into the body of Christ and you were put in there by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and He's a part of who you are. Now, what that brings up is this, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Well, preacher, that means that if I've been saved, born again, blood washed, and going to heaven when I die, then that must mean then that I have uh, uh, certain gifts that have been given unto me. The gifts that are given to you are pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets and that kind of a thing. The gifts are not for you to have the ability to ostila shantai untai a bow tie economy Honda. Amen. The gifts are not for you to have the gift of healing or the gift of handling snakes or drinking any deadly thing. As a matter of fact, leave your finger here in 1 Corinthians 12 and look in Mark chapter number 16. 
Mark 16. Now I'm getting off of this for just a second because I want you to clearly understand that even though you've been baptized and you have the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit will enable you to live the life that you ought to be living, ladies and gentlemen, but that doesn't enable you to have certain gifts that will distinguish you from everybody else. God will give you an enabling over a period of time. If God calls you to preach, He'll give you the enabling to be able to preach, but it doesn't come all at once. It takes a period of time and it has to do with your willingness to yield. And after a period of time when you yield, you don't have supernaturally where your eyes roll back in your head and then all of a sudden you start to have this gift of prophecy or something, which is the most ludicrous thing you've ever seen. In the Old Testament, if a prophet spoke by the Word of God and he spoke by the Spirit of God, if he had one part of that that was a lie, they took him out and stoned him. Well, if that's the case, you'd have every televangelist on the TV right now, every one of them would be dead and they'd have a bunch of stones piled around them. You say, why? Because stupid people continue to support that and they continue to put out uh, uh, information where these false prophets are up there and if they prophesy at all, it's under another spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Amen. You say, what? That's not for this day and time. Now, why do I bring that up? Because we're still fighting this thing when it comes to these charismatic gifts. And that's a part of something that happened a long time ago, and it'll continue to happen. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 teaches you clearly that when the devil comes during the tribulation period, that he comes on a platform of signs, wonders, and miracles. And what people are looking for nowadays is the sensational. They don't like just plain preaching and plain singing. That's what we have here. We have singing and we have preaching. You say, why? That's what pleases is God. It pleases God by the foolishness of preaching, not putting on a circus or a sideshow. I mean, I guess it'd be an easy way to fill up a building if you honestly believe that the preacher had the gift to be able to heal you. Well, the first thing I'd do is I'd go to the hospital. We got three in the hospital right now. I'd go to the hospital and say, folks, y'all got to excuse me from the service tonight. I need to go to the hospital and heal some people. And why would I stop with just the three that I know? Why not just go to every room individually and walk in there and pray and lay my hands on them, James 5, and have them get up and, and they're healed up and let's go take a little 40-weight oil, dump it on their head and they're healed and get to the next one and that kind of a deal. I mean, what a sham. Think about that. Jesus Christ never misfired one time. Amen. You say, why? He had that ability to do that. Why? Signs are for who? Jew, not for you. You're not a Jew. There's neither Jew nor Gentile in the body of Christ. You can't claim that. You're not even grafted in as far as being a spiritual Jew. You're not a spiritual Jew. You're the bride of Christ. Amen. That's somebody that doesn't read their Bible. That's somebody that doesn't pray. That's somebody that doesn't rightly divide the Bible. You have enough sense to know that. I mean, you're not a spiritual Jew. You're a saved man or a woman. You're the bride of Christ. Amen. That'd be a step down for you to be a spiritual Jew. You know why they do that? Because they want you to take Old Testament promises of prosperity and well-being and so on and so forth and say that that makes you spiritual because you're God's chosen people. You're not God's chosen people. The Jews God's chosen people. You're His bride. And you say, well, why do they do that? Because they think that it makes them look spiritual because they're driving a fancy car, they live in a fancy house, and they got some health that happens to be going around right now. And because of that, they say, well, I must be spiritual. Look how God's blessing me. That's as crazy as the stuff that Gothard used to go around saying that if God's really blessing you, He's the one that opens and closes the womb and if you don't have children, it's because these other people are more spiritual than you. Hogwash. Hogwash. Baloney. Not even good baloney. What foolishness. I don't care if you got as many kids as the Honeyfields do. That doesn't make you spiritual. You better be spiritual if you're going to have that many. <laughs> but that doesn't make you spiritual. It'll make you wish you were spiritual. But that doesn't make you spiritual. It doesn't matter if you have one or none. Right. And it has nothing to do with that. Well, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. That has to do with realizing that if I got a bunch of kids, I'm more well protected, but somebody can't take what belongs to me in the Old Testament. It has nothing to do with you in the New Testament. I mean, if you want to be reproductive, you know what you should be reproducing? Souls. You should be reproducing sheep. Sheep are supposed to reproduce sheep. You ought to be winning people to Jesus Christ. When was the last time you tried to win somebody to the Lord? It doesn't take much to be uh, just to give them a track. It doesn't take much to tell them a little bit. Just give them a short witness. You don't have to put them in the boat every time you talk to them. When was the last time you did that? You should be doing that. But the very idea that you're spiritual because you can tell by how many kids are behind you or you can tell by whether or not you have some kind of a gift. I mean, anybody in here can fake the gift of, of uh, tongues. 
Anybody in here? I can tell you places where I know of. I don't know if they're still there. I used to study it a long time ago. I knew places back up in the woods up in Tennessee, back where the stills and stuff were, where they used to have uh, snake handling services and all that. They sounded like uh, the Indians up there when they'd get into a trance and stuff. I know what they did. They went out and they took those rattlesnakes and stuff. It's always a rattlesnake because of the fangs that came out. And they'd milk those rattlesnakes so that if that snake bit them, that they wouldn't be poisoned. I guess not. You don't have any poison in the poison sacks. They take that thing, that snake comes out there, they put it down there and puncture it and they drain it out and then that way when they get bit they say, see, I got the gift. Uh, they drink poison. I'll make the poison and let you drink what I make. I'm not going to give you just you know, a, a quarter of, a, of an eyedropper full of uh, strychnine. I'm going to give you a can of Drano. I mean, let's be real. If it's poison, I mean, he's talking about drinking poison. That's talking about wormwood. That means everything you turn up, this idea that I'm going to take a little, a little bit of poison. Well, you have enough of that in a Coca-Cola anymore. I mean, they're making it out of bugs and stuff nowadays to get you the right caramel color and all that kind of stuff. They squash a bunch of bugs to make sure you get... Yeah, that's what they do. They want you eating bugs now. Well, I guess you got to get meat somehow. I don't know. <laughs> But, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a sham here. Mark chapter 16, we're prior to Paul's ministry. Is that right? You're prior to an individual being baptized into the body of Christ. Your people in the Old Testament weren't put into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. That gospel wasn't even around yet. How could they be saved the same way? It wasn't even preached yet. It was a mystery that wasn't revealed until Paul came along. Amen. It just makes common sense if you think about it. Well, yeah, that kind of does make a little bit of sense. You weren't put in the Old Testament, and the and I mean the Holy. You weren't put in the body of Christ in the Old Testament. The Bible would say the Spirit came upon him and the left, and the Spirit came upon him and it left. You say why? There's no sealing. The sealing comes after you're saved in the New Testament, after Calvary. Mark chapter number 16. Notice what he says in verse number, uh, let's see, make it uh, 15. And unto them he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What gospel is that? Death, burial, and resurrection? It can't be. They don't even know about it. I've heard that repeatedly said over and over and over. Go to all the world and preach. Guess what else they do with it? He that believeth and is what? There's Acts 2.38 right there. That's not for you. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Now you see how much Bible you already know? I mean, you could unhitch the wagon right now and go home and have a ham sandwich and you'd be completely fine with that. You say, why? That's not written to you. It's written for somebody and that gospel will be preached in the tribulation again, but it's not for you. You say, why? Your baptism is not connected with your salvation, but it's connected with somebody. Your baptism is a spiritual baptism, and you're put into the body of Christ. Can you explain that? I mean, can you explain? It's a mystery of godliness, God manifests in the flesh. That's tough enough. How about the one where Jew and Gentiles in one body? How about the one, the manifestation of Christ in you? Well, I thought he was in me. Well, how's he in him and him and her and him and her and her and him and her and him and her? How's that? The same one that lives in me lives in you. But it's one. But it's a million. It's in everybody. I can't explain that. But I know this. I know that if I divide the Bible, my salvation isn't proved by me doing the things I'm fixing to show you. You know what's he going to do? He's fixing to show you some things to confirm the word, whether or not these individuals actually got it. Look in verse number 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. They got converted now, and they're supposed to follow them that believe. And my name they shall cast out devils, and shall speak with new tongues, and shall take up serpents. If they drink any other thing, deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay the hands on the sick, and they might recover. No, they shall recover. Come all the way down to verse number 20. They went forth and preached to everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with what? For who? Jews confirming the word. So every time that uh, those signs show up, come back over to 1 Corinthians 12. Every time those signs show up, ladies and gentlemen, there's an unbelieving Jew present. And it's to done to confirm the word or to help the unbelieving Jew. Yeah, but preacher, didn't Cornelius speak in tongues? Yes, there was an unbelieving Jew present. Who was it? It was Cornelius. 
is there. And he's the Gentile that speaks, but who's the unbelieving Jew? Peter. He doesn't believe that it's been given to the Gentile. You say, why? Because when Jesus Christ first called him out, he said, Go not to the way of the Gentile, nor to the Samaritan, only the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He wasn't off in his Bible. He didn't believe that. And so what the Lord did was loose Cornelius' tongue, and Cornelius was able to speak Hebrew, probably. Peter understood him in his own language. Cornelius is probably not a Hebrew. Or no, he's not a Hebrew. He's a Gentile there. And he probably spoke Italian or whatever else it might be. Some kind of a Roman thing. But whatever it was, he was able to speak a language. Why? I'm going to show you in just a minute. Tongues is nothing more than a language. Tongues is your ability to speak a language that someone else can understand. It's not a prayer language. A prayer language. My foot, man. You ever worry about that? Does that ever shake you up? That you get down and you get ready to play? Hey, Brother Vargo, I'm glad you and your wife are here. I'm glad you're back home. But, uh, but do you ever think about that? You ever uh, get ready to pray and if you were to all of a sudden break out and nostril shantai and untie bow tie and that kind of a thing, have you ever thought that maybe that might be the devil in you and you might be blaspheming God? What good would that prayer do you if you don't even know what the prayer was? What good would it do you? How would you know you got an answer or didn't have an answer? Why would you want to pray and not understand it? Don't you know that part of the benefit of prayer is to know that you're able to pray in a language you understand and see God answer the prayer that you just prayed? Amen. Don't you realize how real that makes God? I mean, you ever been in a real twist and having real hard things going on? I got two answers today of something I've been praying nobody knows about. I got two answers today for those prayers. And all I said, you didn't even know I said it. All I said was, Lord, thank you. I sure appreciate that. I sure appreciate that. You say what? Uh, you say, well, I just, just happenstance. No, it's not. I prayed specifically and God answered the prayer. You say, what? Well, it makes God real to me. I don't care what He means to you. He means that to me. You say, why? Because what I ask you is something minuscule. It's something small, but it was enough for the Lord to realize that I heard you. I got you. I listened to you. And here's an answer to your prayer. What a stupid thing for me to get down there and bumble and, and garble in some unknown language and think I'm spiritual as a result of that, not even know what I'm saying. And the Lord said, well, you ask this and you ask that. Well, preacher, you know, what about the verse that says the Holy Spirit makes a, a intercession for us with groanings and utterings we, we can't say? I'll tell you what that is. That's when you're up there and you're offering it the way you are, the Holy Spirit said, now what He really means to say is your will be done. And he really thinks he wants a bicycle, but he lives up on the top of a hill up there. And if you give him one, he'll break his fool neck. So don't give him a bicycle. Give him a little red wagon. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, does. that's what he does. It has nothing to do with whether or not you can hear it. What do you care what the Holy Spirit does with it? It's how you're praying. Amen. Look in 1 Corinthians 12, talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Ghost. One of the questions we had in Bible school, I mean in Bible school, in, uh, in uh, question and answer, was uh, preachers, there's a difference in the, I mean, in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. Yes, the difference is the Holy Spirit deals corporately and the uh, Holy Ghost deals individually, personally. He deals with you personally. He doesn't deal with nations anymore. Not yet. He'll come back to it in the tribulation. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Look down, if you will, to verse number 12. For the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, there He is, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all been made to drink into what? One Spirit. And then he gives the different uh, uh, gifts and stuff like that. And by the way, your gifts don't necessarily mean you're spiritual. Right. You say, why? And this passage I'm fixing to show you here is that if you're going to covet a gift, he's telling the Jews, why don't you covet the best gift? And the one I'm fixing to talk to you about is the one that's the most misused. And it's the easiest one to mimic. It's the easiest one to act like you have. But it's the one that people utilize the most to try to show that they're spiritual. It turns the flashlight on them. All those other things will put emphasis on others. That tongues that makes you look like you're spiritual. But tongues, ladies and gentlemen, come to Acts chapter number 2. Let me show you that. We'll come back to Corinthians in a second. Tongues is nothing more than a language. It'd be like uh, uh, us going to say uh, uh, Moldova when we went over there. And we're over there and they speak uh, partially Russian and I don't know what all the languages are and that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is, I remember placebo. That was thank you, right? I think. But, uh, but, uh, but I don't remember the language. It would be like the Lord giving you the gift of tongues and you're able to speak fluent Russian. 
without ever having a class. And there's going to be an interpreter there, not for the purpose of the individual. You're saying something, the interpreter's telling you what you're saying. There's no confusion going on. You're speaking a language you don't know. You know what that Bible says? He says to you in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14 that if any man speak in tongues, there's never a woman in tongues. Sorry, ladies, that has nothing to do with you. It's just how God wrote it. If any man speak in tongue, let it be by course and at most by three. Let one witness and let one speak and let the other interpret. And if there's no interpreter, let him keep quiet and talk to himself. Now that's the rule for how it's supposed to be exercised. You say, why do you need an interpreter? If I started speaking a language and I don't know what I'm saying, I need him to be able to tell me what it is I'm saying so I'm sure it's not contrary to Scripture. Do you understand? The interpreter is not that I'm speaking. Otherwise, I could just speak English and they do like, uh, um, oh, what was his name? Milcha over in Romania. That guy was phenomenal. Or Vanya that was in Moldova. I think he knew set six or seven languages over there. One of the kindest guys you'd ever meet. And he'd been, but at any rate, you speak in English and then he puts it into, uh, uh, into uh, words that they could understand. Yeah, I remember we were in that one spot over there in that feed bin thing. It was cold, man. I mean, freezing in that place. And they're all sitting around there. And the ladies that were with us, they had put their scarves out there for them on the benches and stuff. The ladies were real troopers in that thing. But at any rate, they're there and we're out in the middle of nowhere. And they're saying, preacher, this thing ain't even on the uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the GPS system. I said, well, the Lord knows where we are, but that may be all. And we might be disappeared now. And you get there and there and I'm preaching along with something about Noah's Ark because they're the very uh, uh, illiterate. They're ignorant when it comes to the Bible. I'm just preaching about the animals getting on the ark. And I said something about, I don't remember, it was a raccoon or a squirrel or something like that. And Vanya said, uh, uh, we don't have a word for that in our language. <laughs> I said, you know, how, I, was it a raccoon? I think it was a raccoon. I said, you know, the thing that's got like a little bandit uh, eyes uh, thing on there and got curls on the tail? He said, we don't have an animal like that. <laughs> he said, come up with something else. I said, how about a possum? He said, what's well, a possum? <laughs> I said, okay, a uh, rabbit, you know. And I said, you know, kind of, but, but they didn't even have a word for that. You know why there were hardly any animals there? Right. What did we see when we were there? Four cats? Maybe. You see birds. Hitler came through there and ate every animal they had. The guy told us it was a joke. He said, if you ever see a guy running out this way and about ten guys chasing him, it's because somebody saw some kind of a live animal and they're all trying to run him down and get to the animal first. <laughs> he said, there's no animals here. You never noticed that before. There's no birds tweeting in the morning. No birds hopping along out there. No, no cats, no, no animals of any kind, chipmunks, squirrels, rabbit, nothing, nothing, no animals. You say, why? Hitler ate them out of house and home when he came through there. They haven't recovered from it. Some of the richest, blackest dirt you'd ever see and some of the most beautiful crops and their vegetables over there taste like coming off a fruit tree. All organic stuff. They don't have all the pesticide junk that we have. And you go out there and you look for acres and acres and acres and acres and acres and acres of fields and stuff like that with produce out there like you can't imagine. But no animals. And it would be like you go into that place, we're out there on the street, we're passing out tracks and things like that, and with the exception of Brother Demopolis and Brother um, uh, Hamilton that was there, they know enough of the language to be able to speak fluently. We didn't know anything. We finally learned that one placebo, but other than that, we didn't know that stuff, and we're passing out tracks. It would be like me all of a sudden speaking Russian, and Brother Hamilton say, Brother Peacock, you just said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believed in him. I said, that's what I said? He said, yeah. He said, say it again. I can if the Lord doesn't give me utterance. That's tongues. Amen. That's you standing in the middle of Ho Chi Minh Trail and being able to speak fluent Vietnamese without ever having a lesson. Right. It has nothing to do with the spiritual language where you roll your eyes back and you say a bunch of demonic stuff. You're speaking another language, okay? It's the language of demons. Yep. That stuff's dangerous stuff. That stuff's more dangerous than messing around with a Ouija board. You say, what? That's why the Lord warned you about the way it's supposed to be done, decently and in order. Look in Acts chapter number 2. So I want to make sure that you understand that when we talk about the giving of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that we clearly understand it's not to give you a gift, it's to give you salvation. 
It's not to give you speaking in tongues or handling deadly things and so on and so forth. Acts chapter number 2. Verse number 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. It must have been something good to see. They're all in unity together. I guess you could say that if you were in unity together, you might expect the Lord to show up a little more often. At any rate, and suddenly there came the sound, the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So it would be the noise, like you can imagine what a, 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 a rushing a mighty wind would sound like. Um, uh, close, close your eyes a second. Just close your eyes. Trust me, I'm not going to come hit you or nothing. Close your eyes for a minute. It's hot. It's hot in here. Get the, get the fire extinguisher. You say, what is that? That's the way you did it in radio. That sounded a little bit like a fire crackling, didn't it? It was not a very good preacher. Well, I was usually better with a paper bag. But you know what happened? It's the sound of a mighty rushing wind. It's however that would sound to you. That sound fills that whole place. It's just a sound. It's not a rushing mighty wind. It's the sound of it. Now watch what else he says here. And then he says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like yeah. as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. How do you think that would be? You ever been to a nice restaurant? I'm not talking about these. Got not, they got knockoffs nowadays. They got these little uh, candle things that are out there, and they don't burn the little tea uh, 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 lights anymore. Nowadays, they put those little uh, battery powered things in there, and they're supposedly flicker. I guess they look fine. You look down in there, you can't even put your straw in there and burn it or anything anymore. You know, or put. That's not what you kids should be doing. Or you can't take the. The straw paper and catch it on. I know y'all have never done stuff like that or see how long you can hold your hand there before, you know, and then slide it across the table and see how she does. And you, you, you. <laughs> but, but you ever, you ever been in a, a place like that? That little flame right there. You say, what is it? Tongues like a flame. Let me ask you a question. How big do you think that fire was? Oh, your tongue's a small member, isn't it? I mean, he says it's set on the fires of hell in James chapter number 3 and that you can get a rudder to, to control a, ton, a ship that's got tons and tons and you can put a bit and a bridle in a horse's mouth and control a 6,000 pound or 4,000 pound elephant, I mean a, a, man, a horse. But when it comes to the tongue, it's hard to control, right? It's an unruly member. But if it's sitting on your shoulder, how big do you think that thing would be? Well, it'd just be like a candle up here. It's, it's just showing you that somebody's there. It's used as a sign of delineation. Certain individuals had it on there. They're singled out as the ones that are fixing to speak another language. It's decently in an order. It doesn't sit on everyone. It sits on specific ones in order to set them apart. And I'll show you, it's the sign of an apostle in just a second here. And the Bible says, and there were at Jerusalem, verse number 5, and there were at Jerusalem, what? Do you see it? All right, verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, capital S, gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. Well, guess what? Those would be individuals that are Jews that are unbelieving Jews. You say, how do you know? Read down to the next verse. Doesn't the next verse say to you, how heard we every man in our own language? They begin to hear in their own language. Tongues is not an unknown thing. Tongues is known to somebody. And so what happens is, is you got all these people that are gathered. Now if you want to know who all are there, now look in verse number 7, just so you can make it clear. Are not all these which speak, all those that have the tongue sitting upon their shoulder, all those individuals that have been delineated, all these individuals that are speaking another language, are not all these what? Galileans. They're the Lord's apostles. And then guess what happens? You come down through there, verse 8, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Prayer language, my foot. Has nothing to do with that. The Lord supernaturally gave them that gift because there's unbelieving Jews present and because He's trying to get the gospel out and to confirm the word, He has those individuals that are listed there with all of the individuals that are in there, the proselytes that are there and the other people that are there. He has them hear it in their own language. That's the gift of tongues. You say, where is it now? It doesn't exist. 
Well, but my grandma, well, your grandma was wrong. Amen. Well, my auntie, uh, your auntie's wrong. Well, but my wife, okay, well, get her a bit and a bridle for the one she's got instead of worrying about whether or not she spoke in another language. Amen. 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 It, it doesn't matter if they're contrary to the Bible. It doesn't matter who it is and how emotionally attached you are to them, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the preacher's wife. It don't matter and make no difference. It's contrary to the Bible. It's a language. You want to know if you have the gift of tongues? Go to India and pray that you can speak whatever that language is. Hindu, I guess. Or you want to go uh, to Saudi Arabia or somewhere there and speak Arabic? Or you go to Israel and speak Hebrew? That's tongues. It's a language. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Don't you let anybody tell you anything else but that. You say, what is that? They're trying to open up, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you to get you into another world. When you do that, you invoke another spirit. And I am highly suggesting to you, with no apology for it at all, that you don't have any business with the spirit that controls that thing. The Bible says they spake as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's not only that He gave them a language, but He gave them the ability to stop talking when the time was to stop talking. You said enough. Knew exactly what they were supposed to say, exactly the way they were supposed to say it. There's no confusion whatsoever. How hard we ever man in our own language. This is odd. We're all here. We all speak. Look like the Tower of Babel here. I heard that guy speak in my language, and I heard that guy speak in my language. Well, I heard that guy speak in my language. I didn't know what he was saying, but I knew what he was saying. How did that all take place? The Lord's getting ready to spread the gospel, Acts chapter 2. And he's preparing the people. That's for the purpose of getting the word out. It had nothing to do with lifting up an individual, but the carnal church took it that that means they're spiritual because they had the ability and nobody else did. They're making it up. Paul had to give them some rules. Paul had to say, now all of a sudden you've taken something that was supernatural by nature and it was done by course and done the right way and the individuals that spoke were delineated or set apart to be able to do it and the people could tell where it was coming from and now you've turned it into showmanship. Paul said, as a matter of fact, if you're going to covet a gift, why don't you covet the best gift? What's the best gift? Prophecy. What's the prophecy? You're going to hell without Jesus Christ. You're going to heaven with Him. Amen. I just prophesied. He said, why do you covet a gift that turns the emphasis on you? Because everybody thinks you're special because you can speak another language. You say, what is that? That's pride. Amen. Nowadays you have people that have their own languages. They have uh, 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 emojis now that do the talking. You knew how to get in there some kind of way. Or you have these LOLs and these OMGs and, you know, RIPs, I guess. I don't know what all's in there, but you got all of these kind of things that are, uh, that are, that are in there. It's a language. That's not what this is. This is an individual that comes up there and doesn't have the ability to speak anything but Hebrew. He hadn't been to any classes scholastically. He may even be behind the curve a little bit. And then the Lord says, get up there and here's Japanese and here's Spanish and here's Chinese and here's Arabic and here's what a... All the languages that were there during the since the Tower of Babel when the Lord confused their what? Language. Speech, their language. He, what did He do? He divided them because they didn't talk right. He divided the nations not by raising up one against the other. It's you wind up having communication. If you'll listen to me, he wind up having communication. The people speak the same way you speak. And so they divided off into the different nations. That's how he divided the nations. That's how sometimes you can tell who it is that you hang out with and run around with. They talk like you talk. If they're Bible-believing Christians, there's a certain way that they talk. And if they're worldly Christians, it's a certain way they talk. You saw the play tonight. That was a great play. Yep. Well, I sure thought I'd get a whole lot more than this. I mean, all the things I did, yeah. Yeah, the only reason you, you, know, you made that was to check out your recipe, so it would be good for you. And the only reason, I mean, boy, I thought, man, good night. Stop it. I thought the rest of these kids were going to be on there. I'm like, I've had enough already. I'm ready to go to the altar, you know. And you got the guy that comes up, oh, well, I didn't think I'd get anything. And I've been sick and I hadn't been able to do this and that and the other. And thank you, Lord. I can't believe you'd do this. And I'm thinking, okay, shut it off. Stop it. Stop it. But you ever think about that thing with languages? You say, what does that do? That points to the man doing the speaking. Paul said, covet the best gift. 
rather that you prophesy. You tell people about Jesus. None of us are anything without him. Amen. Look, if you will, please, in 1 Corinthians 12, just to show you this, I've already told you, and I know a lot of you know this, but I'm going to hit this one, and then we'll hit one more and let you go to the barn early. Verse number uh, 23. We're in 1423. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? Well, can't you imagine that? Everybody comes in here and everybody's talking a different language. Don't you think they think you're crazy? Well, I, th I think so. You'd think that's insanity. It'd be like a rock and roll concert. But if all prophecy, all prophesy and come one in that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all and he's judged of all. Why? Because your prophecy is in the same vein and everybody's talking the same language. And then he said, uh, And thus the secrets of his heart are made manifest, and so falling down on his face he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. So the, the, the first sign of the power of God following you in Acts chapter number 2 is they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now it's Peter. How hard we every man our own language and Pete gets up and he gets ready to go to preaching for him there in Acts, excuse me, 1. And when the apostle Peter gets up and preaches, you know what they said? Are not all these men drunk with new wine? You say, what are they telling them about Jesus? Watch. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done to the edifying. How do I edify? Look at verse 40. Let everything be done how? How about that? There should be an order to things. It's not haphazard. Come together, somebody got a song, somebody got a word, somebody got a scripture, you got a word from the Lord, you got this, you got that. No, we got a preacher. Amen. Amen. You know, you got a song? Yeah, are you on the schedule? Amen. Well, I just don't think schedules are right. Oh, okay, you got a schedule for your work, don't you? Don't you? Don't your kids have a schedule? Don't they have a certain time they have to be there? God forbid, God help, bless your heart, man. Don't they tell you what homeroom to send them to? Why don't you just show up there and say, I'll go wherever I want to go. See how that works out for you. When you go to practice, don't they have a time that you're supposed to show up on what field you're supposed to show up or the court you're supposed to show up or whatever? Why is it when it comes to church when somebody says, are you on the schedule? Good. Schedule? Why? Oh, you got to have a schedule. That's life. When you get ready to have surgery, you know it's a strange thing. They may not keep to it, but they try to keep to it. You know what they do? You get scheduled for surgery. There's supposed to be things done. That's edifying. It's doing things the way it's supposed to be done, not haphazard, flying by the seat of your pants. The brethren got all caught up in that a long time ago, and the next thing you know, you just have a, a mess on your hands, like everybody's got full of the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you this, uh, none of us are full of the Holy Spirit all the time. Sometimes we might be full of the devil, but you don't know which one they are if you don't have a Bible and the Holy Spirit to tell. Amen. You say, what do you do? You schedule it. Do you have appointments this week? Sure. I have an appointment at 7.50 in the morning. I guarantee you if I don't make that appointment, I won't be in London tomorrow night. So you're going to London? I'm going to London tomorrow. You're going to London? Yeah, London, Ohio. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what they had the audacity to do? They had the audacity to tell me that you have to be on, there, have to be on that plane at 7.50. I don't stay to a schedule. Okay, don't fly. For years, you know, my boss said, 7 o'clock. That don't mean 7.01. 7 o'clock. High and tight. Well, you know, I'll get there when I can get there. Okay. You see? Decently and in order. There should be an order of service. Not where you schedule the Lord out. Things get changed every now and then. But you've got to have a backbone. You get an outline. You know what you better do? You better have an outline and have a backbone before you start trying to put meat and sinews and put muscles and all that on it and fat and skin. You say, what? All you'll have is a Gumby. Just flops all over the place. All right, now notice what winds up happening. Verse number uh, 27. If any what? That is gender specific. Amen. That is not non-gender specific. It's not referring to male or female. Right. 
You say, how do you know? Look over, if you will, in the same passage right there. Look over, if you will, please, to verse number uh, 35. Uh, make it 30, uh, 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as saith the law. And if they learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. What's the context? You mean a woman can't give a testimony? You mean a woman can't sing a song? I've heard them teach that. The context is tongues. You say, why? Amen. Tongues is for the purpose of prophesying and telling others about the Lord. That's preaching. You're not to usurp authority over a man. Amen. Real good. Amen. That's nothing to do that you can't say amen or you can't say praise the Lord or you can't give a testimony. There's nothing wrong with that at all. If I pointed that out to her, you know what she'd do? She'd be quiet because she'd be in obedience to the Lord. But that's not what that teaches, the audacity. That's a preacher that can't have his wife to be quiet, so he tells her she has to be quiet in the church. But you know what he just said there? If any man speak. Why? It's for the purpose of teaching and preaching. A lady said one time, asked this in a question and answer where I was a meeting one time, and I said that, I said, if you're going to learn, you'll learn from your husband at home. She said, what if your husband's stupid? I mean, I'm talking in a congregation of people. And I said, well, you have to pray about that, sister. Can we have our next question, please? She never even hesitated, man. I said, well, this is what the passage says right here. And ma'am, it'd be better for you to just ask your husband at the house. What if my husband's stupid? And just for a fleeting moment, I thought, well, what does that say about you? You picked him. <laughs> Dumb and dumber? I mean, what is that? <laughs> but you want to be careful about that stuff. You say, why? The, he's showing you some things. He's showing you that the purpose of tongues is the furtherance of the gospel and to instruct God's people. So therefore, do you understand now why the woman is to be silent? It has to do with the chain of authority. Isn't that what it says? Amen. To stand up in the, in the church and, and start preaching or teaching, it's out of order. I didn't write that. God wrote that. Amen. I'm not going to make it non-gender specific to make all the Bible correctors happy. He says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most by three, and that by course. That means one at a time is by course. Yeah. Not everybody's talking at the same time. Right. You ever watch some of those uh, charismatic uh, preaching shows on, I don't know what channel it's on now. Um, it used to be on 13. That was a strange number. It used to be on 13. That was the, that was the TBN, you know, looking for Jimmy Hoffa and Tammy Faye Baker channel. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> they took her makeup up one day and said, there's Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, boy. Y'all gotten a little too thin-skinned. But that's funny. My can back. You've got something out there. All of a sudden, Baker's losing all of his hair on top of his head because every time she bats her eyes, it blows his wig off. She used a gallon of paint and a four-inch paintbrush to put on her makeup every day, man. I mean, silly putty doesn't have anything on her. She's, she's used plenty of it. You push her over, she'll bounce back off off the ground and say, what a silly putty. She comes right back up. But listen to me. You ever watch those shows? Get control of yourself now. It'll be all right. You ever watch those shows? And see the women? And it starts off with hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And the next thing, it's like repetitive. And before long, there's a trance. And before long, there's another spirit that comes in there. And the next thing you know, it's both men and women just... And they think they're having a church service. It says one at a time. Tell me it's not for the purpose of teaching. It's one person to speak so everybody can hear what's being said. See the common sense of it? It just makes sense. You never, you never seen it. Sometimes women that get to up in New York, these two ladies were talking one time. I promise you, man, I thought it was a blue jay fighting over two blue jays fighting over a worm. They're both trying to out talk each other at the same time. They're just going to town like I don't know how they're here. They're answering each other's questions and they're both talking. And I finally said, How do y'all do that? 
And they're like, do what? I said, you're both talking at the same time and answering each other's questions. They said, it's called multitasking. I'm like, let me out of here, man. You're driving me crazy. You say, what's the purpose of it? It's to instruct. And then he says this, if there's not an interpreter so that the guy speaking knows what he's saying, then let him speak to himself. He said, well, preacher, what do, you, what do you think about it? I think everything's supposed to be done decently and in order. Amen. Come to Colossians chapter number 2. We'll close this thing out. Colossians chapter number 2. Preacher, you shouldn't make fun of people. It's kind of hard when you have something like that, when they have built uh, Christian people out of millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. Amen. And we're doing everything we can to try to get a building open over here for the right reason. And they'll send in millions of dollars and buy a prayer rag. And, and, and matter of fact, you can get it. And if you want one, you can get one that's sweat stained. Like I'd want a preacher's rag that he threw down after wiping his head. I'd want his sweat in my pocket. <laughs> that's insanity, man. Oh, you're going to be up there wiping. Here, give us another one. You know, $39.95, man. $39.95. You know, what is that? And Well, I was already dried up there. $29.95. That doesn't have sweat on it, you know. And people buy that stuff, man. And here you have this little thing. It's a, it's a, a, a thing where you can take the Lord's Supper. It came from a real olive tree out of the, out of the uh, olive garden. If they had all of those things that they did that came from the Mount of Olives, they wouldn't be, it'd be a barren desert up there. They, you can't make that many olive wood uh, 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 vessels for you to do. They'd kill all the olive trees. Christian, buy it up, boy. Buy it up. Eat it up. You say, what? Well, it's an artifact. You say, what, you know, the Lord, what do you think the Lord's up there? He's got him an olive uh, glass there, a chalice. What do you think that cup was? It's probably styrofoam. I wouldn't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Colossians chapter number 2. Look, if you will, please, and uh, we'll pick it up. Let's see, verse number 8. Colossians chapter number 2. This is a great verse. Verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, tradition of men, and not after Christ. Verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Come down to verse 14, Interest of time. He forgave you there. Uh, notice what he calls it. He calls it an operation. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that are against us. He took out of the way, nailing to the cross, having spoiled principalities, powers. He made a show of them, triumphing over them, in, uh, 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 triumphing over them, uh, in it. Notice the circumcision in verse number 11, made without hands. Notice it's a baptism, buried with him in baptism in verse number 12. You see that? In baptism, risen with him through faith, the operation of who? You say, what happens when you get saved? You want to know what happens when you get saved? I'll tell you. Then we'll go to the barn, get us a banana sandwich or something. You know what the, the old uh, the, that happens to you. The day you said, Lord, I don't want to go to hell when I die and I'm trusting you as my personal Savior, whether you like this or not, whether you're in fellowship with God now or not, it doesn't make any difference. He didn't save your flesh. You can be just as wicked as the devil sitting here, Judas, but your soul is saved whether you like it or not. If there's a time in your life where you saw yourself as a sinner, believed on Jesus Christ to save you and confessed Him, you're saved even if you're not enjoying the trip. And you know what happened to you when that happened? Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of God, the operation of God came in. He took the Word of God and He cut your soul loose from your body. That's a mind blower. You say, why? That way now I'm safe because He sealed that soul inside me and that soul is now safe from the touch of my body. Physically, I can't damage it or dirty up that soul. You're just a can of beans that's been put away and no matter how dirty and dusty that uh, jar gets, you can't lose it anymore. Well, I don't like that and I'm miserable and God's been mean to me and God's been bad to me. Going to heaven anyway. And get up and you can tell him all about it. You won't regret it when you get there. That's right. You're going to have more than a near-death experience. You're going to show up there in heaven. The Lord said, you know, the way you talk down there, you almost regretted being saved. Would you like to go to hell? Mm. Well, no, Lord. I, I mean, <laughs> what? No, I wouldn't. Well, I mean, the way you lived down there and the way you acted down there and you griping and complaining and murmuring all the time, I almost think you regretted being saved. Well, you know, pre creature, uh, pre uh, Lord, how uh, Christians are and how preachers are. The Lord said, yeah, they're all up here with you. Amen. You know how you are, don't you? 
I mean, it's always everybody else. The Lord says, you know how you are, don't you? You the gold standard? I believe He is, isn't He? Now, you know what happens to you? You had an operation. And the day you got saved, God took your soul and cut it away from your body. And that's the difference in you in Old Testament salvation. You got eternal security. And that's why your soul is safe no matter what you do in your flesh. Now, I didn't say you won't pay it in your flesh. I don't believe that. I believe when I get through with this thing on the fear of God, you'll see that the fear of the Lord is clean. And it should push you toward holiness. It should push you, push you toward living a clean life, the right kind of life. You say, why? Because you fear the Lord. You want to be clean. I don't believe in that, you know, just because you have eternal security, do whatever you want and ask God to forgive you. You put something on you, worse than Ajax, boy, take it. I mean, all right, let's stand together and be dismissed. Thank you for... Bearing with me. Doc,